Hi, good morning. It's Marco from Moose Marketing PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefing show where I've invited a panel of guests to go over the morning's newspapers, discuss their own business stories and their own business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. So I'd like to introduce you to a fantastic panel. We've got John Workman, Senior Partner at BPE Solicitors. We've got Kurt Wyman, Manager Director of Kurt Wyman Chartered Account uh, Surveyor, sorry. Martin Hughes, CEO of Lillian Faithful Care Homes. Andy Bates, Chief Financial Officer at Gloucestershire College. Welcome guys to Punchline Talks Business Breakfast Briefers. So we've got a number of newbies on the show and I'm gonna chuck you straight into the deep end. Deep end. So Martin, I'm going to start with you this morning, actually. So what newspaper stories have you picked out for us today, please, mate? Thank you, Mark. Um, well, my first story is something very topical, and it's in The Guardian today. I've printed it off for you. And it's around the move for the, for the government to introduce vaccination passports. And this is very topical, particularly in the hospitality sector. And I was interested in the government, government's move to nudge people to hurry up and get the vaccine. Otherwise, they're going to need a passport to pretty much do anything in this country in the next couple of weeks. Um, at our own charity, we're trialling this already um, with, a, with a large provider called MyGP. And uh, we're going to be trialling the vaccination passport with our own staff. So it's going to become a very big story, I think, in the next eight to 12 weeks as the vaccines rolled out. And Martin, do you, do you, are you making your staff compulsory to have a vaccine now? Well, it is, it's good that John's on the call, actually, because his uh, employment team are helping us out with that at the moment. <laughs> new staff, yes, because it, they're new, so we can make it a condition of employment. Existing staff, when you've got 400, you've got to be pretty brave to say no vaccine or no jab, no job. And then you've got to look at each person's diversity and reasoning one by one. Um, it's a pretty dangerous and bold tactic. Uh, and you could find yourself at the wrong end of an industrial tribunal or employment tribunal if you're not careful. I mean, your particular sector, I mean, you, you guys have done extremely well at Lillian Faithful, haven't you? You haven't had any cases. We, we've had very few cases, to be honest. And at the moment, 80% of our 450 staff have already had the jab. So we're not struggling too much at all. Um, but I think it will become an issue in the next couple of weeks, I think, where people decide not to have the jab and they find they're a bit stuck. I'm just going to quickly zip around all of you. I don't, I don't normally do this. Um, jabs in pubs, OK, to get in a pub. Yes or no, Martin? I think it's going to happen. I don't think it'll be a yes or no. I think it's going to be compulsory. Andy? Yeah, I think once um, everyone's been given the opportunity to have a vaccine, but yeah, I'd hate to see that um, that the pubs were just full of the older generation because they've had a vaccine and the, and the younger generation um, not possible. So yeah, once everyone's had the opportunity, then, then maybe. Kurt, what do you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with Andy. I think that, um, you know, once everyone's had the opportunity, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you need that passport to get that pint, unfortunately. And John? Why would I want to drink next to a potential killer? <laughs> That's very true. Yes. Yeah. Why would you? Why would you go for a, a, a pipe? OK, thanks ever so much, guys. I'm going to quickly go to Andy. Andy, what have you picked out in today's newspapers, please? So, yeah, I uh, opened the uh, the Times up today. And, and interestingly, the, 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 on the second page, there was this um, headline. It's time to abolish GCSEs, says biggest teaching union. Um, so I thought, you know, obviously very, very interesting. and, and and I think this debate's going to go on a while. Obviously, uh, we had the exam fiasco of, of last year, um, and then now we've announced that there won't be any exams this year. So that's two years with no, no exams. Um, so I think what the teaching unions are saying is, can this stay? Do we need exams at all going forward? Um, so there's obviously a lot of uh, debate both ways. I, um, my personal opinion is I think exams are a good leveller. I think they take away that bias and potential unconscious sort of bias. Um, and even and studies have shown that, 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 that children from the most deprived backgrounds actually do better in, in exams um, because um, it, it is a leveller. So I think it, we need to be really careful if we go down this route of abolishing um, GCSEs. Um, the unions claim 
that um, it will stop teaching to the test. So they're saying that actually teachers will be able to teach a more wet, rounded curriculum and, and they won't be um, teaching to the test. So um, there are two sides to this, um, but I think this debate will, uh, will rumble on. And the fact we haven't had exams for two years has allowed this debate to sort of um, happen. So yeah, really, really interesting story. I think it will roll on. Well, you're talking to a man who's got five O levels and two CSE grade ones. So uh, things change all the time, isn't it, the education centre? Have you got another story there, Andy, just very quickly? We yeah, just um, a small uh, story um, on the next page. And this this um, this sort of came out today. And I think um, the lady involved is doing a speech today. Um, so um, cyber security is being ignored. Um, so um, the head of the National Cyber Security Centre um, just around the corner from us, uh, uh, Lindy Cameron, who uh, took up the post in October as the as the chief exec. She's doing a speech today, um, and she's saying that businesses still aren't taking this seriously enough. She's saying uh, that um, that it needs to be put more to the top of the board agenda around um, around cyber um, cyber skills, and also um, businesses preparing themselves for for cyber attacks and also the aftermath of cyber attacks. I think, um, you know, part of it is actually inevitable that, that companies will get hit. It's how they react to it is, is the most important thing. Um, so yeah, she'll be doing a speech today. So I'd be interested to see what, what comes out of that. But that also links, Mark, to one of the stories you, you ran um, this week uh, in Punchline around, um, around the number of young people taking IT and, and, and subjects. And I think some of the data is really scary. So 40% drop in the number of, of kids taking G GCSEs in IT, a 40% drop just at the time when we want more digital skills and more IT, we're seeing the number of students taking those subjects is, is declining. So um, there's a bit of a perfect storm happening at, at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, something needs, needs to be done about that. But yeah. It says here, actually, I've got, I've got some notes here. 76% of employers say the lack of digital skills could affect the their profitability of the company moving forward later. Well, we'll come back to you later on, Andy, and talk about the college work and what you guys are doing. Kurt, welcome to Punchline Talks. Um, what have you picked out for us for the newspapers today, sir? Right, a number of things. This isn't from today, but it's been picked up uh, in a number of the papers this week um, to do with um, DIY boom. And I think, you know, the, the, the story is basically that the owner of B&Q, which is uh, Kingfisher Group, uh, who also owns Screwfix, um, their pre-tax profits have ballooned by 634%, which to me is absolutely phenomenal. And this is literally over the last 12 months. I think they've gone up from 103 million to 756 million. Um, you know, that is absolutely staggering. And I think, you know, the, the bottom line of that is that the majority of that growth is by online sales. And to me, that's a story in itself. Um, but behind that, when you look at the, the backstory, to me, it highlights the disparity that COVID has caused. Because on one hand, you've got some companies that are doing absolutely fantastically, you know, record profits and so on and so forth. And at the other end of the scale, it's been absolutely catastrophic for some companies. So to me, that sort of highlights the difference. And, you know, certainly the way things seem to be going is online. Um, and when you look at town centres, it's a very difficult place at the moment for, for what we call traditional retail. So, you know, it, it's an interesting one. Um, that's where the market is online at the moment. But I think it just highlights, you know, when you look at some of the, uh, the other end of the scale, some of the companies absolutely struggling through this, particularly uh, the hospitality sector, pubs and restaurants and so on and so forth. And, and, and cinemas, as we've all probably seen uh, with Cineworld. Um, you know, that, that are struggling like mad and it looks like they're going under as well. So, you know, very difficult times, but for some companies doing extremely well. I'd like to know how many how many shelves have been put up wonky uh, because uh, <laughs> I'm actually banned from doing any DIY in our household because I'm, I'm just absolutely loose, loose, useless. Uh, Kurt, have you got anything else before I go um, on quickly? Uh, but very quickly. Um, Interesting one. Uh, this one is in the, the Times, um, but again from earlier on in the week, actually. 
Um, if I can just show you that one. Um, sort of yeah, aligned to a degree of what I've just said. And it's a, an American restaurant chain that I've actually never heard of before. They're called Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. And um, they're about to make their UK debut. And um, they're actually worldwide, they're quite a large company. Um, they've got 3,400 outlets, I think in 29 countries across the world. Um, they're coming to the UK. They're looking at opening about 340 branches in the UK. Um, you know, and it's they, they've got some, it's a little bit like the Colonel Sanders thing. They've got some fantastic Louisiana, uh, you know, uh, recipe for, for fried chicken. Um, you know, we obviously have an insatiable appetite for chicken at the moment. Um, but again, it's interesting because restaurants have been very hard hit, hospitality sector very hard hit. And then conversely, you've got an American chain who are big elsewhere in the world that are suddenly trying to, to break into the market. So a little bit of competition by the sounds of it for, uh, for KFC. Um, I think the brand was founded in New Orleans in 1972 and it's carved the niche in the global fried chicken market. So let's, uh, let's, let's wait and see. It's funny you should mention that one because the two that you've mentioned, I've got on my list of stories that we run in Punchline. I actually popped the MD, the CEO of, the, of that company, an email uh, on uh, on LinkedIn actually to, to invite him onto my Punchline talk, <laughs> the the big interview. Well, you got to you know you got to give these things a go, don't you? <laughs> Thanks very much for now, Kurt. John, welcome to Punchline Talks. Nice to see you again, John. What have you got for us, please? Well, from the Telegraph, being a natural um, right winger. Um, um, and also too lazy to get the papers today. Well, I don't um, want to say anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was up for a late last night. I'm working. Um, the, um, and I wanted to catch up with the box set of Magnum, but never mind. The um, Education Secretary condemns threats to back a teacher. And th what's it's really interesting, because obviously protest is big uh, news, um, obviously with the, uh, the events uh, in Bristol, um, the vigil, uh, for, for Sarah Everard um, and the, 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 yeah, the democratic right to protest um, which is you know must be at the bedrock of of, of, um, of our society uh, in a democracy um, yeah, peaceful protest but the ugly side of it which is um, yeah that's people protesting I mean the fact that they happen to be protesting about an insult to the Prophet Muhammad um, makes no difference to me I and mean, the, the, um, um, any more than uh, it could be a pro it could be a protest by 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 by, 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 by uh, women in london about the sarah ever thing the safety in london it doesn't matter what the subject is what matters is when people aren't just doing peaceful protest and it's it's somewhere from cancel culture through to in this case death threats to a young man with four small kids um you know that, that's yeah this this movement uh, towards um, on, on the line, um, uh, dissemination of information, incitement um, to harm. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, you, you can go from Caroline Flack to the teacher in France who was beheaded in his own classroom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And th there is something going on where um, the digital world is feeding the basis instincts in, uh, in people and giving them license to say and do things um, that they would never have done, uh, um, yeah, in in person. They would probably not have done it with pen and paper. Um, but the um, you know this 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 flood of, of um, simulated or actual outrage um, uh, and yeah, you know, people putting death threats to yeah, you know, perfectly ordinary people um, online and publishing them. And it it, it is it, it's it, it's a moment thought in somebody's head that any civilized person would dispel becomes a permanent record of hatred. And I think that's really, really dangerous. Um, well, I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to stop you there. So as a lawyer then, do you think that you should be allowed to have an account on Twitter or Facebook, whatever, and not actually showcase who you are? No. Because I've had this argument with Alex, with Alex Chalk and with uh, Richard Graham and Sh Siobhan Bailey. we discussed that because they've all suffered from abuse. Um, mm. Alex's view was very different. He, his view was, well, you know, well, how do you then stop freedom of speech in places mm. like China or Turkey, where the people actually need to be hidden? Here in yeah. the West, we, we have a different problem. We seem to be attacked by 
numpty heads who feel that they can say whatever they like because they're hidden. You know, they're dressed yeah. well, as a squirrel or something. My, well, um, if, if, if this is an extremely wide subject, and you haven't you haven't got the time on your program um, for, for, for for the debate, but um, people talk about rights um, uh, an awful lot. They very rarely talk about responsibilities. And there's no such thing as unlimited freedom. Um, unlimited freedom means I can come into your house and kill you because um, because I because I want to. Well, um, that's my freedom. Uh, that, um, I don't have a right to do it technically, <laughs> but where's my responsibility? You know, it's it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, that's what we have laws for. That's what the, the yeah. If you go back to uh, go back to 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 to, to um, 16th, 17th century philosophers, that's the, the social contract. You agree to live in the society. Um, bound by laws because otherwise life is famously nasty brutish and short okay very good views thank you so much john i'm going to now go back over to martin thanks john martin lillian faithful and the care home sector my goodness it must have been extremely extremely difficult running uh, a number of care homes um how many does lillian faithful have here in Gloucestershire? how many people do you, you employ and um, you know what? What are you guys doing next to keep all your customers safe? I know it's a very lot of questions, but no, it's okay. So we've got, we've got five homes, two day centres, uh, half a dozen flats. So we're caring for around uh, three hundred older people. We're probably one of the larger. We are one of the largest providers of adult social care in the county, and we've got four hundred and fifty staff. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge for the last twelve months, naturally, in the care sector. Um, my mantra from the outset was to be decisive. And I said to our team straight from the outset, we're not just gonna do our best, we're gonna do whatever it takes to keep people safe. So for us, we shut a little bit earlier, uh, much to the derision of my finance director at the time, um, I procured a container of PPE from China in February. Um, so we have been in pretty good shape throughout. And part of it is, a bit like, I guess, John or any other business, you've got to trust your model. You've got to trust your reputation. And slowly but surely now our occupancy is increasing. Um, we're, we're looking in good shape for 2021, I have to be honest. That's, that's brilliant news. Thanks ever so much, Martin. I'm going to turn to Kurt now. Kurt, thanks again for joining Punchline Talks. See your boards everywhere. You seem to be having a good time. How long has uh, your business been going? Um, and what's the market like at the moment? Uh, we've been going about 10 years now, uh, Mark. It's our 10th anniversary in July. Um, started off as just me uh, and uh, a piece of paper and a pen. And there's now a few more of us. Uh, we did just for your information, we do a mixed bag of stuff. Probably 60% of what we do is transactional related. So it's the letting and sale of commercial property. We don't do any residential. Um, and the other sort of 30 to 40% is a mix between property management um lease renewals rent reviews valuation work um and sort of professionally based work so it's a bit of a mix and um, in terms of the market it's it's been a funny old time really because i think over the last 12 months i'm sure jo john will bear me out on this um we've actually all been very busy um where this time last year when the the first lockdown came in um admittedly um the phones went quiet for a few weeks um, everybody was working remotely. It was a different time. The sun was shining um, and it was just different for everybody. Um, but once we got over that first couple of three weeks, the rest of last year and certainly the, the beginning of this year has been very, very busy. Not all sectors are the same. Um, and I think when you look at the retail market, you know, without a doubt, that is very, very difficult. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, large... Uh, retail buildings out there that you genuinely think what are they ever going to be used for again um, you know who's going to want to take them but in a way of course what will feed off from that is opportunities they will be used again um, parts of town centres will be redeveloped um, and I think what we're starting to see is that investors and developers are now starting to see the opportunities in town centres which is great but the market for those properties at the moment is hard the, the office sector, a lot has been sort of uh, talked about the office market um, over recent months, you know, the doom and gloom, this is the, the end of offices and so on and so forth. Um, you know, and I, 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 I think, I don't think it is by any means. And um, certainly during lockdown, we, we, we've been involved in a lot of office lettings deals. 
Um, what we have seen is companies downsizing, taking the opportunity to exercise break options, reconsider at the end of leases, you know, do they need that size office? Or, and I think the way people working offices going forwards will change. And I think there, there will be more people working from home. Um, I don't think, you know, interesting, there was a story in um, one of the papers that Nationwide Building Society have actually given all their staff, 3,000 of their staff, you know, the option to either work from the office or work from home. So the way we, we work will change, but actually the office market is still there. It will just change. But the, the market that has been particularly strong has been the industrial market. And, um, you know, that's driven by the fact that there's a lot more online sales. They need warehousing and so on and so forth. And that's, you know, ranging from companies as big as Amazon right the way down uh, to the smaller local logistics company and also local firms that are selling online. And, you know, we've been involved with a number of relatively small startups or companies that are, uh, have had, say, a, a high street presence uh, in retail fashion that are now looking at going online because that's where they see the market is. And they've been taking warehouses. So the industrial market has actually been very, very strong. Uh, so I think realistically, in answer to your question, it's been a mixed bag. The, you know, things have been pretty busy over the last 12 months, um, but it very much varies according to what sector you're in. Okay, thanks very much, Kurt. Uh, right, then we'll move on to Andy. Andy, I just want to tell you that Kurt's uh, into most of your time there. Um, no, only joking. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, Sorry, <they> <laughs> Andy you, you, you're the financial director of Gloucester College. Um, we, we talked earlier about the IT skills, you know, and the, and the thing about the Gloucester College, many people might not know this, but the college is really leading the way um, in the digital skills sector here, isn't it, in the county. Um, there's been a 143% increase in college university level courses, computing and digital degrees. Congratulations, you must be well chuffed with that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're putting a big investment into this. So our Cheltenham campus, we're sort of changing the, um, the, the strategy for Cheltenham campus. I don't know if people know, but uh, you know, a few years ago, we used to offer A-levels from there. Um, we just took the, the decision um, three years ago to stop offering A-levels. We thought there was um, a provision within the county to, to offer that, so we stopped. So what we're looking at now is we're re we're repurposing um, the Cheltenham campus to be a digital skills centre. So um, what we're offering there now is whatever level you want to start in IT, you, you can, whether that's a level two, which is GCSE equivalent, and you can stay there right up to doing a, a UE, uh, University of West of England degree at, at the Cheltenham campus. So for the first time, it, it, rather than having to travel down to Bristol to, to get a UE degree, you can get a UE degree in IT from our Cheltenham campus. Um, and as we know, UWE are ranked at top 20 for, for IT um, degrees in the country, and they've got great sort of relationships with GCHQ um, and, and other business. So we're really excited about that. We've got a three million pound investment from the government, um, which we're working on at the moment, which has been quite, happy, quite good with your lockdown because we've been able to make lots of noise in the campus and, uh, and knock things about. So that's gonna be opening after Easter. Um, with this um, state-of-the-art cyber IT suites. Um, so really excited. Yeah, lots going on around digital and, and, and IT. I'm hoping to come down and see that when, when you do open. I'd love to see Yeah, I, I, I keep wanting to, because some of it's done now, but Ali, our marketing director, won't let me do any photos. She wants to do a big, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 I don't, I'm still into secrecy. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I bet you're there twitching with your camera and she's just holding you back. Scale up for growth, online employment events. I just want to give you a free plug. That's Wednesday, the 31st of March at 2 p.m. Where yeah, so scale up for growth. We've got some grants for businesses, SMEs. So up to £40,000 um, cash um, to support um, projects that will enable companies to grow and create more jobs in Gloucestershire. So, yeah, we're supporting on that. Uh, the, uh, the last thing to say, Mark, is just there's never a better time to take on an apprentice. So government are giving 4K £4,000 cash back for every apprentice you take on. And also we've got some great candidates, as you can imagine, you know, it's tough at the moment for young people. Uh, we've got some amazing candidates that are just looking for that first opportunity. Um, so if any businesses are listening and they, they can give that opportunity, that first job for, for a young person, um, never a better time to take on an apprentice. 
Well, we'll definitely be talking to you. I'm very interested in doing that ourselves for Punchline as we move forward. Uh, uh, right, thanks ever so much, Andy, for now. Uh, John, okay, BPE solicitors, my goodness, you guys have been really, really busy. The corporate team seem to be rocking and rolling and seem to be advising on lots of deals at the moment. Yep. Um, it's, well, for corporate, it hasn't really ever stopped. Um, COVID didn't really have that much an impact. I mean, the phone stopped ringing, people re, re et cetera. But there were a few, yeah, as, uh, as Kurt said earlier, the phone stopped ringing for a few weeks, but after that, it hasn't stopped ringing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what you see of what we do, um, you know, quite a lot of what we do, we can't tell people <laughs> um, uh, or are doing because quite a lot of it is um, um, confidential or in some cases price sensitive as it relates to the uh, the AIM market, alternative investment market. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the because um, um, a lot of people thought 31st of March would be a very good idea to get things done in case tax rates change for CGT, where we are um, phenomenally busy at the moment, although the actual need has gone away, as you know, with the budget. But, um, so a lot, of, a lot of timetables didn't change or we started so we'll finish. So that's pretty uh, that's pretty busy. But we've got a, um, I, you know, a pretty strong pipeline that's certainly going into the summer. How many people work at BPE at the moment? Uh, well, it changes about... It changes about once every two days, but at the moment, I think it's about 130. Well, wow, okay. And um, the furlough screen is about to come to the end. Uh, I'm sure, you, do, do you foresee a, a rise in the number of employment, you know, uh, tribunals and unfair dismissals, or are businesses pretty clued up now, do you think? Well, <laughs> I think the, I mean, so much depends on the speed at which the economy bounces back because if the furlough scheme dries up as the economy uh, is, 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 is rising back I mean, a lot of those people will find themselves oh good they're back at they're back in work um obviously um there will have been structural changes in some industries and you know, hospitality being one of them um and retail and it may be that you know, the only thing keeping some of those people on the payroll is furlough and when it goes um you know, there, there, there will be a sudden change, but it's, you know, it's going to be, yeah, I would expect there to be some some increase, but um, I hope for the sake of the people involved and, and for the UK economy that it's not it's not massive. I and mean, we do have high unemployment at the moment relative to, to, to historical recent history. And um, you, you'd hope that, you know, that's sad though it is with all those people. I mean, whatever the employment rate, if you're unemployed, it's 100% unemployment. Um, Sadly for those people, um, but I think most of the most of the pain has already been taken, and I would expect to start to see that going down. And the certainly the employment uh, agencies we talk to and work with, uh, some clients, some suppliers, are all seeing um, vacancies go up. Uh, so, um, yeah, whether the, whether yeah the people who, who have been made unemployed sadly um, have the right skills for the vacancies there are now, well that's you know, that's what happens in structural change. There's got to be a gap, and I guess that's where institutions like Gloucester College come. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks ever so much, John. I'm going to quickly whip round you guys. We're running out of time. It goes very, very quickly, as you know. Very quickly, we'd like to pick out a, a story from Punch. And John, I'll, I'll start with you. Is there something that's caught your eye this week, Punch? Well, I was going to talk about something which Andy's going to talk about. So, well, don't worry about Andy. We're, you know, we're, we're no, no, friendly, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Um, no, actually, well, I'm going to pick on the the, um, the, 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 the Mears results announcement that you featured yesterday, because as you know, we're, we, we're, we're long-time suppliers uh, to, to, to Mears, and I think we're in year 26 now, um, having done the, worked on the original flotation in 96. Um, and it's, it's great to see them having um, you know, bounced back from um, you know, the, the massive uh, COVID impact. Um, I know... Um, that they were extremely quick to react to COVID. That they 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 were they were making structural change anyway, going into it in terms of the the service lines they offer and um, and some divisions have been have been sold off to uh, get to raise cash and and, and and create a more concentrated business. So uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great success story. Um, always has been and still. <clears> and, uh, I'm very uh, we are very proud to be associated with it. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Right, Martin, what have you got for us very quickly, please? Um, From Punch. Same, same sector as I was, a charitable sector, but a lovely story in Punchline around uh, one of our business partners, Creed uh, Food Service, working with the Wiggly Worm charity 
if you don't know the Wiggly Worm charity, it's a smashing little charity. They are over Easter going to provide 18,000 meals to children who would normally get school meals right throughout the county. And if you ever read of that story, it's absolutely heartwarming. Wiggly Worm, one of my favourite little charities in the county. It's a great story. Now, we're going to give them some extra publicity as well in the next magazine and, um, yeah, try and support them a bit more as well. Thanks very much, Martin. Andy, uh, what's your story from Punch, please? Yeah, so the one I picked out on is the vinyl sales on track to overtake CD sales. So um, you reported that uh, vinyl sales will see its highest total since 1989 um, and actually it's overtaken CDs um, which I think is, is remarkable uh, comeback and uh, it's one close to my heart because I, I actually started my career in the record uh, industry back in 2000 I joined um, EMI Records straight from the university um, and that was at the time you know before streaming um, and CD sales in 2000 I think you know were, were very high and all the record companies were filling their boots with selling CDs at 15, 16 pound each, um, uh, if those re remember. Um, but then since then, the record companies have had a tough time, you know, a real tough time in the 2000s um, with, um, you know, illegal streaming to start off with. And I think, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think the record companies now, you know, are starting to, you know, they've hit the bottom, they're starting to build up again. I think it's, it's going to be a, a good time for, for record labels going forward as they, they actually now starting to monetize the streaming and, and working out how they can actually make, make money from that. So yeah, I thought it was really interesting uh, story. Okay, thanks very much. And, and your favorite album of all time? Uh, so oh, you hit me on, on um, I, I quite like some of the Radiohead stuff from okay. uh, back in, 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 in the day when I was in Oxford, yeah. Okay, right, Kurt, thanks very much, Andy. Kurt, what's the story you got from Punch now? We're literally running up with the last minute, please. Right, very quickly. Um, yeah, I'm just really pleased to see that Gloucester Folk Museum is saved. Um, it's been bought by, I think, the Gloucester Civic Trust. Um, you know, I, I can remember as a kid going in there, such a fascinating place and a lovely building. And I know that there's been a question mark hanging over it now for quite a few years as to what's going to happen to it. Um, you know, they do a lot of educational work as well there. I know that generations of school children have been and done the Victorian um, school experience at the back. So I'm just really pleased to see that, that that's got a new lease of life and they've got great plans for it going forwards. Top album? What's your favourite album? Um, uh, it would probably be one of the White Snake albums. Um, is it Saints and... No, that's Saints and Sinners. Is it, no, it's not that one. Um, it would, it, I, you put me on the spot, Mark. I would probably say it would be one of the White Snake albums, but I can't think of the name. Okay. Right, I'm going to leave you. Martin, what's your favourite record? Then, John, what's your favourite record of all time, please? Um, unusually, at the moment, uh, ACDC Thunderstruck. Goodness, gracious, all heavy stuff, you guys. John! <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, rather, 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 rather more, um, rather more progressive for me. Uh, close to the edge, by yes. Okay. Well, yeah. Mine's mine's the Boomtown Rats, Fine Art of Servicing. Okay, <laughs> guys, thanks ever so much for joining Punchline Talks. Really great to see you. And uh, there's no Punchline Talks next week. We're having a bit of a break, but we'll be back on the 9th of April. Hopefully, you'll all be safe and see you very soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>